The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Alistair McLeod, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello, this is Alistair McLeod on behalf of Gold Money. And with me, I'm delighted to have Godfrey Bloom, who is MEP for Yorkshire and North Lincolnshire. Is that, is that right? Have That's I got right, absolutely. Right? We don't call it Humberside. Oh. We don't call it Humberside. <laughs> I'm delighted to hear the counties are still in there. Yes, indeed. Um, I, I'm very interested to talk to Godfrey because he is one of the few um, uh, people in politics in Europe who um, uh, are not ashamed or not frightened to admit that um, the state is probably the wrong way to go. The state interferes with everything. And you would like to see the state rolled back. Is that a fair description of your overall opinion on um, economics, if I can put it that way? Yeah, 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 yes, indeed it is. Um, uh, we have too much government, too much government interference, and too much regulation. We have, certainly in the United Kingdom, we have nearly 50% of GDP uh, is uh, government spending. Uh, we have national debt, which is rising 10% a year. Paradoxically, this government came in to do something about the national debt, which is interesting because uh, in 2015, when the United Kingdom has an election, they'll find that the national debt has increased by 50%. Uh, yes, and th this, is, this is despite all attempts by the Chancellor, um, apparently, to try and keep government spending under control. It's still rising, um, uh, as, as I understand it, all he's managed to do is to cut the rate of increase a little bit. It, it, interestingly enough, uh, he boasts, he's a rather boastful young man, uh, he boasts that he's uh, trimmed uh, the deficit spending by 25%. Well, of course, anybody who can use a pocket calculator knows that if you want to reduce your debt, to any significant effect, you have to reduce your deficit spending by 125%. Yes, so, so all he's managed to do is to cut what was originally projected sometime in the past in terms of increases. He's just managed to pare back the, those, those increases. Yes, he's still overspending to the most extraordinary extent, and he's boasting that he's not overspending to quite such an extraordinary extent as his predecessor. Uh, so... <laughs> Yeah. So no good will come of it. You cannot, and I, I blame the Chancellor, I blame the United Kingdom, but of course it's absolutely no different in the United States. Obama is doing exactly the same thing. There is almost no government uh, of any significant Western uh, economy uh, that is not, that is not. So everybody is in debt and everybody's debt is getting bigger. And I fear... Uh, that things are going to go very, very badly wrong, possibly sooner than most people think. Mm. Now, this is an interesting comment, because you were on um, an economic um, committee, is it, in, in the European Parliament? Indeed, I am. I'm on, the, e e I'm on the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, and uh, which is, my parliament is not a proper parliament as an Englishman would understand it. It's an amending chamber. Uh, the law is made by the Commission at the Berlimont building here in Brussels where we're speaking. Uh, and it comes to my parliament, loosely termed a parliament, which is an amending chamber. And we fiddle around with subsection 6, paragraph 2. Uh, but the uh, financial regulation now uh, for Western Europe, or the European Union, if you will, uh, now comes from Brussels. Uh, so it's the law is made by bureaucrats who have no understanding whatsoever of international banking and, and finance. And who, who are unaccountable. And totally unaccountable. I do not have access to minutes. So, for example, two years ago, I found myself trying to explain what an investment trust was to my committee. Because um, they didn't know, because an investment trust is a peculiarly British beast. So they didn't understand what it was. And I had to explain it to them. So they are regulating things that they don't understand. And an investment trust, I think you and I would agree, is a very simple, simple oh, investment. Yes. It, it couldn't get more simple than that. But they're, they're also, of course, regulating hedge funds, which were unbelievably complicated. And after even nearly 40 years in the city of London, I wouldn't dream of trying to regulate because I wouldn't feel I had the expertise. Well, there's also the problem of um, jurisdiction. If you start trying to regulate them and... 
they've you 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 cramp their style they just move their location to somewhere else of course nobody owes the city of london a, a, a living i mean the city of london uh of course is a focal point for international banking and finance for a number of reasons it's english speaking uh the time zone is correct uh, it's historically correct uh, but make no mistake, uh, it could leave London just in the same way as our motorcycle industry left in the 1950s and 60s. Every single motorcycle was made in the United Kingdom uh, when I was a very young fellow. And um, suddenly, over, almost overnight, we didn't make any motorcycles at all. Uh, and it could be the same way with, um, with, with financial services. It could go to Zurich, Geneva... Um, tomorrow, or even uh, e even if... Uh, even Singapore, Hong Kong, wherever. I mean, well, it's, yes, it's, and it's, if they wanted yeah. a time zone, I mean, all you need to do is to, is to, is to start, start up financial services somewhere else, which isn't in the European Union, a city-state type of affair, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, within that uh, Economic and Monetary Committee, um, would you say that there are many of your colleagues who... Um, actually understand properly the relationship between the state and society? Or are they all uh, neoclassical economists um, or not economists at all? I mean, uh, what is their mood? What is their sentiment? I mean, this, I think this is the importance of this question is in the context of the financial problems we have besetting most of the major, major currencies today. One of the problems we have uh, in the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, of course, being in a democracy, <laughs> well, I say a democracy, uh, not really a democracy, but in, 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 in the illusion of democracy, uh, it means that the members of the committee, generally speaking, are lay. They are lay people, so they don't have any understanding. Uh, you know, there are house, Danish housewives, there are uh, French uh, trade unionists, so on and so forth. So nobody in the committee has any real depth of understanding. We have one or two people who have worked for Deutsche Bank or something like that. They're probably more dangerous because they actually think that they understand international <laughs> banking, and of course yeah. they don't. All right. Um, I think there's also another problem on, on, on that line, and that is uh, when, when you and I were in the financial services industry, um, we actually had to have a very, very rounded approach to things. We had to understand a broad cross-section of markets, and so we understood where they were and they all fit in together. Um, the current generation, it seems to me, are very much specialists, and they know their particular area probably extremely well, which is why they're so highly paid. But they know nothing beyond that. And do you, I mean, does, presume, does this characterize the sort of, if you like, the bank, the bank employees who are now serving with you on the committee? Do you think that's a fair it's comment? It's very funny you should say that because in my, uh, in, in, in my CV that I put out when I'm speaking at bank seminars and so on and so forth, which I do quite a lot of, uh, I say a background that you might argue like ours isn't possible nowadays. I mean, I was a fund manager uh, on fixed interest. Uh, I was the, the uh, general manager of a life assurance company. Um, I've done all sorts of things over 35 years in financial services, and I've been on the sales and marketing end as well, yeah. uh, which was great fun. Um, so I've done lots of these things. That isn't possible now, I don't think. Uh, if you look at my CV, and, and I would argue perhaps yours, that just isn't possible now. No, it's uh, not, you wouldn't no. be able to have that broad range, and you're absolutely spot on. Uh, so people do not understand anything that isn't immediately in their field. Uh, and what is immediately in their field very often is for a fee or a commission, uh, so they don't look more than two or three days ahead. They're traders or dealers, or uh, uh, and, and of course, with politicians, they're looking to the next election, which is never more than a couple of years away. Yeah, exactly. So what, So I, what? the impression I'm getting from you is that this, this, this lovely-sounding... Um, Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee actually is populated by people who really, yourself accepted, haven't got a clue what's going on. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I don't turn up. I get quite a lot of stick for not turning up uh, very often. I only turn up if I've got an opportunity through that committee to cross-examine, um, you know, the president of the uh, World yeah. Bank or the IMF or a commissioner. And I turn up then, which is all on my website, to have a look at uh, you know, so I can really cross-examine them. But you see, the problem is that they are trying to regulate. Uh, the regulation, regulatory approach that they have really is a bit like constructing a concrete aeroplane. Um, yes. uh, they, uh, 
Uh, regulation, as we know, prescriptive regulation for financial services, we know simply doesn't work, it can't work. And in the Austrian approach to uh, uh, economics, it is the fatal yes. conceit. By that, we, we mean the Aust- Austrian economics rather than Austrian Yes, economics. Austrian yeah, economics. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's, uh, it is the fatal conceit. To regulate a market, it would mean you have perfect knowledge of the market. That which, isn't which, possible. Which, which, which is impossible, and there's so many assumptions in there as well. Of course, so you can't. So it's prescriptive. So I don't turn up and I say, look, you're trying to... What do you have? Is, you're designing a concrete aeroplane which doesn't work, and it keeps crashing. And you keep on thinking that if you extend the wind more concrete span, on it. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes or exactly. change the pilot. Yes. Or make bigger Rolls-Royce yeah. engines instead of Pratt & Whitney or something like that. Look... The long and short of it is, ladies and gentlemen, on the Economic Affairs Committee, if you're listening to this, uh, it's a concrete aeroplane. It won't fly. There's no point in changing the seats around or the pilot. Yeah. You need to start again. Simple, but they don't get it. They just don't get it. No. <laughs> and, you know, they're politicians. They wouldn't, would they? No, that's right. Now, um, I think that's quite a good metaphor for government generally, um, uh, coming back to the UK, I think there's an interesting situation because UKIP um, did extremely well in the local elections. Now, local elections are not general elections. Um, I think you've got roughly 20% um, on most polls of um, electoral support if there was a, an election tomorrow, which, of course, is always a hypothetical question, as we know. Um, it is possible that you might <clears throat> split the Conservative vote to the point where they have to come and talk to you, which at the moment they're resisting. And I think Mr. Cameron is not even mentioning the name UKIP in public. <laughs> so um, so <clears throat> there is an interesting situation. Now, I'm not interested in the politics so much, but if the ball rolled your way uh, politically uh, as a party, how would you seek to influence the economic future? Because I, I, I mean, the reason I ask this question is that everybody associates UKIP with anti-EU, um, anti-immigration, and so on and so forth, which is, if you like, the Sun Reader's version. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested to get to the nub of how you see the economic future for the UK, if you have a say in it. Well, uh, representing Yorkshire, as I do, of course, I have a slightly different perspective uh, from the south of England. So, because all my votes, I'm elected on the Labour vote, what we would understand as old Labour. Yeah, so it's a broad cross-section, actually. Yes, and in the other day, in, in, we talk about the uh, local elections, but, of course, in South Shields, which is a very depressed part of the world, uh, we came second, and a very good second. Um, so it isn't... We, 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 we take... We, I hear a lot about splitting the Conservative vote and taking Conservative votes. This is only true maybe in Kent or Sussex, or Surrey. It isn't true in the rest of the country. I mean, we came top in, to be a little bit parochial, we came top in Hull, Grimsby, Rotherham. These are not the heart, Tory heartlands. And I'd like to think it's because of the force of my personality. I'm afraid it <laughs> well, isn't. it probably is, but anyway. it isn't. It is no such thing. Okay. I think the thing is, and I'm an ex-soldier, um, the sergeant's mess vote, we get the sergeant's mess vote, where I regard the common sense of the nation to be is the artisan, what we might have called in our youth, the artisan classes. People who are intelligent, uh, not necessarily had the benefit of an expensive education, but they know when they're being cheated. They don't quite know how they're being cheated, but they know they're being cheated. So, I, mean, what, so you're, I think what you're saying by another way is they suspect actually they're being shot a line by either of the big parties. That's quite true. Yeah. That's quite true. Right. So... If we, if, you know, if if we end up with a situation where either you hold the balance of power, which which um, with the electoral system, I I would have thought is kind of difficult, um, but we don't know. Um, your input into the next government's economic policy. I mean, if we can focus on that, how do you see how how do you see you influencing economic policy? Can you um, deal with the Sir Humphreys in the civil service who are protecting? Uh, you know, their, um, their departments, uh, their way of life, their way of thinking and all the rest of it. And um, I mean, if you go in and start talking Austrian economics mm-hmm. to people who are trained Keynesians and in the Bank of England trained monetarists, how is this going to pan out? How are you going to win against them? Uh, this, that, that, of course, this is, the, this is the real battle. And I lecture quite a lot at universities who are taught Keynesian economics 
And in fact, an interesting situation at Newcastle University only the other day, one of the young undergraduates went up to speak to the head honcho uh, of economics and said, why aren't we discussing Mises? Why aren't we discussing Marx? Why aren't we broadening this? And he was told that the economic debate is over, um, and if he wanted to talk about things like that, he should be reading philosophy, which I find dangerously frightening. So it is embedded so in they were our ducking, schools. So they're just ducking the whole issue. Oh, they don't yeah. even know they're ducking an issue. This is the thing. They're not ducking an issue. No, I wouldn't accept that. They are so unbelievably stupid, they don't even know there's another issue to duck. Uh, and uh, this is the problem, whether it's schools. I mean, I speak... I give. Uh, I, I don't like to be associated with a specific school because I think it restricts, it restricts your view. Um, but obviously, I'm very sympathetic to the Austrian uh, uh, persuasion. Um, but I do feel that when 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 I suggest that government shouldn't run things, when I suggest that government shouldn't be a, a total, when I when I when I criticise a failed welfare state, and when I say that, I don't mean just social welfare. I mean corporate welfare. Yeah. Uh, when I criticise that, uh, I, at, at a fairly senior public school the other day, they, the, the children actually were... Gu I could hear the intake of breath when I suggested that welfareism had failed. Uh, they, you know, regarded me as a monster. Um, but, of course, it has failed and it can't continue. One of the fundamental failures of Europe and North America, to a certain extent, is welfareism. You know, it, it, we cannot yeah. continue to borrow money to pay people... To not work. No, I, that, that I think is a very good point because it, it's not just not working, but the whole structure of uh, the welfare uh, state in Europe um, is just so incredibly expensive. Uh, we've had a lot of um, comment, for example, in, in, in the United States about the cost of their welfare system. And Professor Kotlikoff came up with an estimate uh, whereby he said that the net present um, cost, if you like, of future liabilities in fiscal 2012, rose $11 trillion. I think even the, the Congressional Budget Office comes up with a figure like $5.6 trillion or something like that. Um, but when I compared those figures with, the, with Europe's, I found the situation in Europe far, far worse. Um, now, are the European politicians really sort of aware of this? I mean, I, I ask this in the context that Hollande, when he got elected as president, the first thing he did was he cut the the um, uh, the pension age by two years, and uh, you know which which is complete completely crazy, if you like, in the context of the deteriorating situation with uh, with regard to welfare costs. I mean, do you see the politicians in Europe even beginning to address this? Uh, no, there is an atmosphere of complete denial, um, as only people in a Brussels or Westminster bubble, politic or, or White House bubble can do. The denial is the way that they handle crisis, um, uh, as politicians probably have done for down the ages. It just seems to be much more apparent than it, than it ever yeah. was. So they are in a state of denial, but of course they are detached. So, for example, here in Brussels, here in Brussels, the, uh, the bureaucrats do not pay income tax. Uh, yes, so they that's, don't that's pay amazing. tax. Uh, their pensions are non-contributory. They are final salary. They have creches for their children. They are not living like you and I live. And to an extent, this is true of Westminster and true of American politics. They do not live in our world. So they have been bought. <laughs> I <laughs> often wonder, now it's interesting you say that, because it's, of course, politicians and journalists are the other side of the same coin. And I, I often wonder, being relatively new to politics why um, people go into politics or journalism. I can't believe they start out being so cynical or naive or stupid. I don't believe that they started out that way. But uh, financial journalism, economic journalism, for example, if, if I may suggest this, let me give you one example um, who sells more books than both you and I, who have been, I would argue, strategically right for many years, is Will Hutton. He sells more books than you and I ever will. He's now master of an Oxford college. He has never been right about anything, no. <laughs> any economic forecast or assessment he's made in his entire career. And when I was working for an investment bank as a strategist, basically the argument was if you get it right more than half the time, if you're 51% right in your calls, 
that's as good as it gets. And I'd like to think I'd be right a lot more than 51%, but you can earn a good living being 51%. Yeah. Uh, Will Hutton has been... I mean, even a broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs> Will Hutton has never been right. But who's the guy that sells books? Who's the guy who's yeah, master in Oxford it's, College? It's so Will being Hutton, yes. right yeah. uh, hasn't got a lot to do with anything. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, can, I can understand that, and I can appreciate that. So um, we, we have... Uh, um, we're, we're beset by problems. Um, and I think the Will Huttons of this world would probably tell us that, you know, this is in our imaginations rather than reality. Um, uh, every time I turn on the television, someone's saying that, you know, there are good numbers out of the States and, you know, it looks like consumer confidence is up. Um, and uh, house prices are up and all the rest of it. Of course, stock markets are buoyant. And so... Um, it, what I would like to ask you is, in your opinion, are these wonderful indicators like high-flying house prices and stock markets and bond prices, um, have they got anything good, you know, sort of, um, how should I put it, something which should give us joy and happiness and confidence about the future, or is this just a bubble uh, about to be popped? How do, how, do, how do you see that? Well, I would sort of uh, view Keynesian economics as a little bit like sort of 18th century doctors and their leeches. The, the, the patient is dying of anemia, so what we haven't done is put enough leeches on him. It's very good for the leeches. Very good for the leeches. <laughs> yes. Uh, but not good for, very good for the patient. And, and of course, that, that's one of the problems, uh, I think, that we, that, that we have. So they will always argue, uh, argue that... Ah, it would have worked, but they didn't put enough leeches. The patient died because they didn't put enough leeches on, and Keynes are the same. Ah, we didn't throw enough money at the pot. Yes, the, the, uh, absolutely. The problem. This, this is the Krugman. The right. Krugman, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the Paul Krugman uh, uh, approach that if it fails, um, it will have failed because we didn't... Didn't do enough. We didn't do enough. Um, and uh, I think that's, uh, that's one of the problems uh, uh, that we have, is trying to win the intellectual argument. Because... We could also, I would argue, the fact that we have had the Krugman system uh, now, I would argue, since the war, since the late 1940s, and it's failed. We all know it's failed. Uh, and if government spending uh, was good, uh, the economy should be buoyant because, my goodness me, there's been enough public spending. Uh, so uh, if you take the natural progression of argument, why aren't we all health and safety inspectors? Why don't we make... We've got 28, 29, 30% youth unemployment. So the obvious thing is to make everybody a health and safety inspector. Yeah, uh, and, make, and make work programmes. And yes, all the rest make of it, work. Yeah. Let's yeah, have three, exactly. like the old yeah. Soviet Union, let's yeah. have two men in a lift. Yes. You know, working yeah. the lift. Let's pretend, as the great Soviet thing was, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah. uh, when you have a detachment, when you have a detachment from salaries and income tax and pensions, as politicians have, um, uh, an increased budget, for example, for the bureaucracy here doesn't mean to say it hits them in their pocket. So a 6% in increase doesn't mean a 6% increase in their tax. It so, affect so, so, so I think what you're saying is rather, ra rather than um, you know, looking at the bubble thing, what you're saying is that the underlying economy actually is at least as bad or probably worse than you and I think because um, when it comes to real production... Um, we're not actually progressing, if I can put it that way. Um, I mean, there are areas where we do progress. I mean, things like, uh, um, you know, sort of computer technology, internet, and, you know, and, I mean, some wonderful inventions and so on and so forth. But, you know, that's only just part of life. The rest of life is not really progressing. Um, and so to that extent, uh, all the euphoria in markets has got to be more on the bubble side than backed by any reality. Is this, is this where oh, yes. you're going? I mean, we get fake figures. The point is, most of the time, we're not given figures that actually mean anything. Most of them are skewed. So, for example, if you look at CPI or RPI, if you look at the government statistics, they would argue that inflation is running at about 3%. Uh, how, joke. <laughs> well, how you square that... How you square that, for example, in the last 12 months, the price of potatoes has doubled. Mm. Now, um, yes, we, don't, we live on potatoes, but we don't leave, live on flat screen TV. Yeah. And the problem is, of course, with statistics, and this is what I used to do because I'm a boring sort of individual who has to look at these things, um, you, you have to know how to interpret them. 
and people don't know how to interpret statistics. Quite senior. I know some professors of economics who don't know how to interpret statistics. Let me give you an example. Flatlining statistics. If you take the 1920s, they were like, ah, yes, but there wasn't inflation in the 1920s because if you look at the graphics. But of course, uh, and I have an argument with a very senior economist in my own party, I may add, because uh, we all have our different views, Um, He says our quantitative easing doesn't cause inflation. Well, of course, it does. If you print money, it causes inflation. Now, it doesn't mean to say it's inflation that you can necessarily see on a chart. And and, and also there there are time lags and the inflation effect is not even. I mean, the Cantillion effect and so on and so forth. You're you're absolutely right. But the question, the the simple question is, uh, where would bond prices be? If there wasn't quantitative easing. Well, exactly. I mean, zero interest rates, um, close to zero bond yields. Precisely. Yeah. Now, you, you would, uh, if there wasn't quantitative easing, the price of bonds would collapse. Uh, but if you look at it, it looks like it's flatlining. And also the other question is, uh, there are two major questions, in my view, in economics. It's very simple. You don't need to be an economist. It's got nothing to do with getting degrees or, or diplomas in economists. It's, it's probably straightforward. There are, first of all, there are two kinds of people... Two kinds of people, wealth creators and people who spend wealth. Now, society will say, oh, we need our doctors, we need our soldiers, we need our policemen. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough, you need those. Um, But you must never get away from the fact that public spending takes money out of an economy, it doesn't put it in. That's fundamental. And most people don't understand that. Most people don't understand that. It's extraordinary. I agree with you. Um, You you, you talk to people, they think that government can actually redistribute wealth, if I can put it that way. Yes. They don't. They don't. All they do is they take wealth from someone and destroy it. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, it, it, is it possible? I mean, this, is, this I think, is where uh, UKIP's um, economic approach could well be different. Is it possible to persuade the man in the street that the state is not the panacea for everything? The state cannot actually um, provide the things that he wants by him ducking his own decisions, by him ducking his own choices. Is it possible to... I, in the... I, I, I don't know. I speak to six forms and undergraduates a lot, a lot. Uh, and there is a really deep ingrained feeling amongst them, and I'm talking about even places like Durham University where they're all card-carrying members of the Conservative Party. So they are on the right, or the centre-right, certainly. Uh, who d- believe that deep down in their souls, because they've been brought up, they're now the third generation of people who believe that government spending is fundamentally, broadly speaking, a force for good. Uh, very difficult. Public sector broadcasting course with the, uh, the BBC believe it's a force for good. They would, wouldn't they? They are recipients of government spending. They are bound to think that way. Uh, so there's nothing intellectually challenging going on. So... But not only is it just a question of people understanding that the wealth-creating sector pays for everything at the end of the day, there's that. And this is an extraordinary thing you find on uh, on every newspaper, tabloid newspapers. (coughs) I've just mentioned the price of potatoes doubling in 12 months. Well, that's bad. We all know that's bad. If the price of a loaf of bread has doubled in the last 10 years, which incidentally it has, that's bad. Why is it good that the price of your house has doubled in the last 10 years? Yes, Why point. would the roof over your head doubling be good news and the price of a loaf of bread doubling be bad news? It's intellectually lazy, uh, but of course, generally speaking, all your financial journalists, your journalists, your public se- sector broadcasting, people are extremely shallow. I do a lot of TV. We're not even sorting out the questions. UKIP's job, UKIP's job in my view, is to start asking the right questions. Yes, and I think, um, I mean, it's going to be an interesting transition because um, it seems to me that part of the part of your job is to sort of get away from the shorthand where, um, you know, you're just um, associated completely with um, restricting immigration and um, being against the European Union. It, interestingly enough, um, the, the conservative spin of the conservative press, must bear in mind that the press are virtually owned by the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom. Um, they say, ah, oh, UKIP doesn't do detail. I'm going to see Alistair Heath, who's a very well-respected economist, I think, by both of us. Yes. Um, I'm going to see him because he perpetuated this myth. I'm seeing him next week. Uh, and I have a, quite a significant bag, 
almost a, a case full of uh, papers. And, I mean, I I competed for the Wilson Prize uh, on, uh, 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 on the Economics Prize. Um, I've I've written a couple of books um, on these matters, uh, and, and Roger Helmer on energy policy is 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 an expert. We have an enormous amount of expertise. We have produced an enormous amount of documents in significant detail. But it suits the conservative press and the establishment, because bear in mind we are a significantly anti-establishment body. They are. They don't do deal. It's Nigel Farage's party, uh, and they don't do detail. Well, look, uh, uh, Nigel is very good on television, uh, and he's a great leader and a charismatic man. He is not UKIP. There's a broader, there is a broader uh, machine. Significantly behind, broader yes. machine. Uh, and it's very insulting to the sort of 30,000 members and activists and the other 12 uh, MEPs and experts that we have. Not of, with all, I agree with necessarily, Professor Congdon and people like that. We have significant expertise. We have far more expertise than the main parties. I mean, Roger Helmer on energy would make mincemeat of Ed Davey. Mincemeat. I would mince at the dispatch box the chance of the Exchequer. I would destroy him in minutes. Yes. Uh, Nigel Farage would destroy the Prime Minister in minutes at the dispatch box, which is why they are so desperately keen to keep us out of Westminster. Boy, would there be trouble if Nigel and I were in Westminster. Big trouble. Well, um, apart from uh, <laughs> the deteriorating financial and systemic condition of our world... Um, I think we've got two elections to look forward to. There's um, the European Union, which is sort of around a, it's early next year. Yes, May May, 90, uh, May 2014. Right, May. And uh, then there's uh, Westminster in 2015. Yes, indeed. So we'll see. Anyway, Godfrey, thank you very much indeed for taking part in, part in this uh, podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. We will watch developments with interest. Yes, indeed. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section. British beast. So they didn't understand what it was, and I had to explain it to them. So they are regulating things that they don't understand. And an investment trust, I think you and I would agree, is a very simple, simple oh, investment. Yes. It, it couldn't get more simple than that. But they're, they're also, of course, regulating hedge funds, which are unbelievably complicated. And after even nearly 40 years in the city of London, I wouldn't dream of trying to regulate because I wouldn't feel I had the expertise. Well, there's also the problem of um, jurisdiction. If you start trying to regulate them and you, you, you cramp their style, they just move their location to somewhere else. Of course, nobody owes the City of London a, a, a living. I mean, the City of London, uh, of course, is a focal point for international banking and finance for a number of reasons. It's English-speaking. Uh, the time zone is correct. Uh, it's historically correct. Uh, but make no mistake, uh, it could leave London just in the same way as our motorcycle industry left in the 1950s and 60s. Every single motorcycle was made in the United Kingdom. Uh, when I the information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Alistair McLeod, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello, this is Alistair McLeod on behalf of Gold Money, and with me I'm delighted to have Godfrey Bloom, who is MEP for Yorkshire and North Lincolnshire. Is that, is that right? Have That's I got right, absolutely. Right? We don't call it Humberside. Oh. We don't call it Humberside. <laughs> I'm delighted to hear the counties are still in there. Yes, indeed. Um, I, I'm very interested to talk to Godfrey because he is one of the few um, uh, people in politics in Europe who... Um, uh, are not ashamed or not frightened to admit that um, the state is probably the wrong way to go. The state interferes with everything, and you would like to see the state rolled back. W w is that a fair description of your overall opinion on um, economics, if I can put it that way? Yeah, 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 yes, indeed. That if you want to reduce your debt 
to any significant effect. You have to reduce your deficit spending by 125%. Yes, so, so all he's managed to do is to cut what was originally projected sometime in the past in terms of increases. He's just managed to pare back the, those, those increases. Yes, he's still overspending to the most extraordinary extent, and he's boasting that he's not overspending to quite such an extraordinary extent as his predecessor. Uh, so, uh, yeah. so no good will come of it. You cannot, and I, I blame the Chancellor, I blame the United Kingdom, but of course it's absolutely no different in the United States. Obama is doing exactly the same thing. There is almost no government uh, of any significant Western uh, economy uh, that is not, that is not. So everybody is in debt and everybody's debt is getting bigger and I fear... Uh, that things are going to go very, very badly wrong, possibly sooner than most people think. Mm. Now, this is an interesting comment, because you are on um, an economic um, committee, is it, in, in the European Parliament? Indeed, I am. I'm on, the, that? E e I'm on the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, and uh, which is, my parliament is not a proper parliament as an Englishman would understand it. It's an amending chamber. Uh, the law is made by the Commission at the Berlinmont building here in Brussels where we're speaking, uh, and it comes to my parliament, loosely termed a parliament, which is an amending chamber, and we fiddle around with subsection 6, paragraph 2. Uh, but the uh, financial regulation now uh, for Western Europe, or the European Union, if you will, uh, now comes from Brussels. Uh, so it's the law is made by bureaucrats who have no understanding whatsoever of international banking and, and finance. And who, who are unaccountable. And totally unaccountable. I do not have access to minutes. So, for example, two years ago, I found myself trying to explain what an investment trust was to my committee. Um, because they didn't know, because an investment trust, indeed it is... Um, uh, we have too much government, too much government interference, and too much regulation. We have, certainly in the United Kingdom, we have nearly 50% of GDP uh, is uh, government spending. Uh, we have national debt, which is rising 10% a year. Paradoxically, this government came in to do something about the national debt, which is interesting because uh, in 2015, when the United Kingdom has an election, they'll find that the national debt has increased by 50%. Uh, yes, and th this, is, this is despite all attempts by the Chancellor, um, apparently, to try and keep government spending under control. It's still rising, um, uh, as, as I understand it. All he's managed to do is to cut the rate of increase a little bit. It, it, interestingly enough, uh, he boasts, he's a rather boastful young man, uh, he boasts that he's uh, trimmed... Uh, the deficit spending by 25%. Well, of course, anybody who can use a pocket calculator knows uh, 